Good afternoon, parents, brothers, sisters, friends, past, present and future students and those who are celebrating their graduation today. Welcome to Melbourne Polytechnic's graduation ceremony for the students that finished their studies in 2019 and 2020. Are you excited? Yeah. Oh, come on, you can do a bit better than that. It's been three years. Are you excited? Yeah. Oh, that's more like it. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Ben Murphy, world record-breaking illusionist, comedy magician, television actor, television host, executive producer, and over-actor. And I'm thrilled and honoured to be your MC tonight, today. Uh, today, we have graduating students from the academic departments of Bridging and Preparatory. I hope I got that right, I apologise. Arts, Business Advanced Manufacturing and Logistics, Food, Fibre and Animal Industries, Human Services and Education, and Arts, Education and Agritech Higher Education. It's going to be an incredible ceremony, and I look forward to speaking to you all a little bit later on. But for now, I would ask you all to kindly stand for the official party ceremony. Procession. Please be seated. And how about a big welcome for our official party members. We are now delighted to share with you a short video with a welcome from all of the different wonderful languages that make up Melbourne Polytechnic. Enjoy. We welcome people from all over the world to Melbourne Polytechnic to build one community. Melbourne Polytechnic le da la bienvenida a la comunidad latinoamericana. Melbourne Polytechnic mengucapkan selamat datang kepada Indonesia komunitas. Melbourne Polytechnic Gujarati samudaya ini selamat kerja. Melbourne Polytechnic Gujarati samudaya ini selamat kerja. Melbourne Polytechnic Gujarati samudaya ini selamat kerja. Melbourne Melbourne Polytechnic Gujarati samudaya ini selamat kerja. Melbourne Polytechnic Gujarati samudaya ini selamat Polytechnic de Melbourne le da la bienvenida a la comunidad de habla hispana. A Melbourne Polytechnic está de braços abertos para todos os falantes da língua portuguesa. Melbourne Polytechnic Punjabi Community da Tahun del Swagat Kardahe. Shukriya. Melbourne Polytechnic accueille toutes les communautés francophones. Ayuboa. Melbourne Polytechnic Ayatene, Obasem Sadre en Piligano. Melbourne Polytechnic e Posakova do Bredoide na Makedonska Tazenica. Melbourne Polytechnic, Bangla Vasha Vasidirke, Shagota Janai. Melbourne Polytechnic Hindi bolne wale logon ka swagat karta hai. Il Politecnico di Melbourne accoglie la comunità della lingua italiana. Melbourne Polytechnic betrahab bil jaliya al arabiya. As taraf personal va kadr amuzeshi danishgah Melbourne Polytechnic be hame shoma farsi zabanan aziz khosh amad migim. Melbourne Polytechnic jamun kam dong ve Vietnam. I ljudi koji pričaju hrvatski su dobrodošli na Melbourne Polytechnic su. Melbourne Polytechnic tervita besti gel kanalavat kogogonda. Melbourne Polytechnic приглашает украинское, российское, русскоговорящее сообщество. Melbourne Polytechnic mengucapkan selamat datang kepada semua masyarakat berbahasa Melayu. Melbourne Polytechnic 欢迎港语的朋友加入我们的团队. Namaste. Tapa yang lain Melbourne Polytechnic mah selamat datang. Melbourne Polytechnic, welcome to everyone. How beautiful is that little video welcoming us all in all the different languages we have here at Melbourne Polytechnic. Absolutely gorgeous. This afternoon is such a special occasion for each and every graduate. Your family and friends are here to congratulate and celebrate with you all. An important part of this evening is having everyone receive the same respect and celebration as one another. So we ask that you stay seated until the end of the ceremony, even if you've already been up here and received your award. And a reminder, photography will still be available on level four after the ceremony for those that have bookings. 
And we do ask for you to be as loud and make as much noise and celebrate one another as you can. And please do also include the Auslan language for applause. That would be greatly appreciated if we could all get involved. Please turn off all phones to silent and refrain from using flash photography. And for those of you that have family and friends and loved ones that were unable to make today, we are uh, streaming live on YouTube. It'll also be available afterwards for you to go home and watch and see how wonderful you all look coming up here and receiving your graduation. And uh, for those of you that are live streaming right now on YouTube, I do hope that you enjoy what we have to offer this afternoon and that you've got great internet connection because it would be absolutely awful if anything <laughs> went wrong. <laughs> and a million dollars. So that's something exciting to hang around for, be sure for that. Uh, now, please join me in welcoming Ac Uncle David Tornia to present the Welcome to Country. <clears throat> Woman Jika, I'd like to pay my respects to my ancestors elders past, present and emerging, and to respectfully recognise the trauma, sacrifice and displacement our elders and ancestors have experienced. <clears throat> the choices our ancestors made in these times is the reason why our culture survived and is the reason why I'm able to stand in front of you today. I also want to recognise the commitment you are making here today by engaging in one of the oldest continuing practising ceremonies performed in this country. <clears throat> by paying respects to the spirit of this land and its first people. Through this, you've shown the willingness to honour sacred ground that we all walk on. As a descendant of Melbourne's first people, the Bunurong people of the great South Eastern Kulin Nations, I'm pleased to be able to welcome you, today, welcome you here today on behalf of Papanata Caroline Briggs AM. You are standing on the traditional country of the Bunurong people, who are one of the five language groups that make up the South Eastern Kulin Nations. These groups being the Bunurong, the Woiwurrung, the Jajawurrung, the Tonurong, and the Watharong. Our traditional country now consists of a great multicultural city we now know as Melbourne. The importance of our, of our land and our culture, the spirit of Bunjil and his gifts of generosity still influence our land and our people today. What we have learned from our ancestors passed down through generations still resonate with us. These include the core values of learning, showing respect, celebrating life and honouring sacred ground. As Australians, whilst we come from different clans, language groups or even countries across the world, we can all learn from these core values. The word welcome in Bunurong language is woman jika, but its translation to English is to come with purpose. It's also a spoken contract between the Bunurong people as the custodians of this country and yourselves to ensure our laws are adhered to and to guarantee safe passage for those who ask. According to traditions, this land has always been protected by a crater bundle who travels the wedge-tailed eagle and by Wa, who protects the waterways and travels as a crow. Bundle taught the Bunurong to always welcome guests, but requires us to ask all visitors to make two promises which I've asked you today. To obey the laws of bundle and to not harm the children or the land of bundle. This commitment was made through exchange of a small bow dipped in water and the spoken words, woman jika. So woman jika, mern bik bik bunurong, nam dirt brapan utter wulam. Come with purpose to bunurong country, the land of the two bays. This is bunurong country, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle David. Uh, I'm now pleased to invite our Chief Executive to give her congratulations and welcome to you all. Boasting an extensive history with Melbourne Polytechnic and in the wider education community, our first female CE was appointed in 2017 and has been in the VET sector since 1986. Please warmly welcome the CE of Melbourne Polytechnic, Francis Coppolillo. Thank you and welcome. And thank you to David for that wonderful um, welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Kulin Nation whose lands we are meeting on tonight, today. <laughs> and for those who are joining us online, I also acknowledge 
the traditional custodians of the lands from which you are joining us. Melbourne Polytechnic acknowledges the educational practices that have been taking place on these lands for hundreds of years and recognise their ongoing connection to this country. I pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today. Graduating students, members of the board, distinguished guests, Melbourne Polytechnic staff, family and friends, a warm welcome to this graduation ceremony for 2022. Some of you have, may have attended a virtual graduation ceremony last year and how liberating it is to see your faces without the confines of a screen. I understand how important in-person events are to you and to all of us. In this post-COVID world, I think most of us have a richer appreciation of collective experiences and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share this important milestone with your loved ones in real life. Here at Melbourne Polytechnic, our graduation ceremony is the celebration and culmination of our students' learning journey. It should be said that for most of you here, your learning journey over the past few years has been anything but typical. Yet you learned to adapt to the changing environment, you accessed support from your teachers who ensured your learning continued with minimal disruption. And most likely, you also leaned on your peers, your friends and your family for support when the going got tough. These are learnings and lessons that you will carry with you for your life. In making your graduation today, you have proven to the world, but mostly to yourself, that what you have, that you have what it takes to thrive in what is a rapidly changing world. And let's be clear, rapid change is here to stay. It's driven by technological advancements, economic change, a global pandemic and climate change. And the best way to navigate change and to adapt in an uncertain environment is lifelong learning. As you close this chapter of your learning journey, we look forward to welcoming you back in the future to continue your learning as your careers unfold and evolve. On behalf of all of us at Melbourne Polytechnic, we offer you our congratulations and our best wishes in reaching this significant milestone. And remember, never stop learning. Congratulations. Thank you, Frances. She is right. How wonderful is it to be able to come here in person after all these years and not be on Zoom? Isn't it great? Just uh, remembering to put on pants occasionally is a little bit difficult. There's a few times I've walked out the house and I'm like, oh, not on Zoom. I'd now like to introduce Mark Blanks, Executive Director of Curriculum, Innovation and Teaching Excellence and Acting Executive Director of Academic Operations to deliver the academic address. Mark. Ah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Academic address sounds rather stuffy, doesn't it? So I'm trying to go, going to try and make this as light as I can. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on completing your qualification and making it to the finish line. The finish line may have seemed a very um, in, the, in the distance at many times, and particularly through COVID, you've had a number of challenges. But from me and from the, um, all of the people at Melbourne Polytechnic, well done, you did it. You deserve to give yourself another round of applause. So, as this adventure closes, another one's about to open up for you. How exciting. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. When I was asked to deliver the academic address this evening around the theme, Never Stop Learning, it gave me the opportunity to pause and think about my career journey. My career didn't follow the neat, predict predictable, linear trajectory that my parents and my teachers inferred was ahead of me. It resembled more like a game of snakes and ladders and twists and turns and unexpected detours. My career was punctuated by the closure of industries and the emergence of new ones, all of which meant returning to study and retrain. I can almost guarantee you that your careers will take a similar journey. You're likely to, encourage, to encounter a myriad of changes over the next few decades, disruptions that will impact your careers and working lives. And I think there's quite often a narrative where we should be concerned about this. I'm here to tell you that that's okay. 
So as I approach what I think is the midpoint of my working life, I'd like to share with you this evening a few highlights of my career journey so far. So this is um, one of the jobs, one of my first jobs that I had that I'm going to talk about. May come as a surprise to some of you, some of my colleagues know this, but some may not, that my first job was a thing called a Connie. Now, for those of you who know what a Connie is, put your hand up. Only a couple of hands. That's the generation gap right there. Um, a Connie was a tram conductor. And back in the 1990s, I had the job of a tram conductor. It's a job that stretched right back into the start of the 20th century with the advent of the electric trams. Trams are something that we love here in Victoria and they're very much a Melbourne thing. Now, this was a, this was a marvel in the modern day. My job on, on, as a tram conductor was to walk up and down the tram, collect and sell tickets. I had a little punch to punch the paper tickets, of all things, a little bag, um, which would, you'd carry the tickets in. And also, I had the very, very important job of helping passengers, mums, seniors, prams, and all sorts of people get on and off the tram. Interestingly, I was one of the last generations of tram conductors in Victoria. And as I was thinking about um, talking to you this morning, I was actually thinking of one of the people that I worked with as a tram conductor, a gentleman named Jack Evans. Jack Evans was, was a, a gentleman when I first started working as a tram conductor about the age of 16. He was about 70 and he was working as a tram driver. And I worked many, many years with Jack on the tram that you saw just before. Interestingly though, Jack was one of these people who'd never had any other job than a tram driver. So at, the, at a very young age, when he was about my age, when I was a tram conductor, 16, he'd, he'd applied and become a tram, tram driver and that's all that he'd done. So it was interesting for me because it was quite a juxtaposition as during the, during the 90s, due to technological disruption and dastardly automatic ticketing machines, tram conductors were no more. So my career, all of a sudden, had a big big hurdle put in front of it. And it would not be the first and not the last time in my working life that my career would be just would dis disrupted by the forces of change outside my control. Interestingly though, in juxtaposition to Jack's story, when I started a tram conductor in 1990, the job I have today that I hold right now did not exist. After my short-lived career on the trams, I studied arts in history and sociology and photojournalism at university. It was also a time that a new thing came along called the World Wide Web, which changed everything. So what you'll see there is a picture of me in front of um, a very old and outdated computer. The other reason I really wanted to show you that photo was to prove that at one point I did have hair. <laughs> Um, I graduated during the recession of the uh, early to mid-90s, a tough time for a former tram conductor armed with an arts degree. My mother was mortified that I had an arts degree. She thought that I was going to be permanently unemployed and destitute and out in the streets. Um, so I found employment managing a rather large Im business, importing antiques and furniture from all over the world, but in particular a lot of furniture coming from India. Oh, from Indonesia, sorry. After a few years of doing this, had quite a successful business, a military conflict in East Timor meant that there was an embargo all of a sudden on Indonesian imports. This coupled with a motor scooter injury um, meant that my days of hauling Indonesian furniture were numbered. So you'll see a photo there of um, the injury that I had, in fact, I, I crashed that particular motor scooter and you can't see in that motor scooter photo I had hair. Um, my shoulder was actually um, ripped off my arm and it took me six months to recover. So I couldn't actually do the career that I would, I'd set myself out upon. So career number two, bit the dust for me. So sitting there, I did a stock take of my skills. I'd done a few things in the world and I found that my Photoshop skills that I learnt at university gave me something to fall back on. For those of you who are um, you know, familiar with Photoshop, Back in the 90s, I think it was like Photoshop version 1 or something that I used and it was amazing that the fact that you could cut things out of photos and swap people's heads and all those sorts of things. Um, and I look back now at what people do in that, in that area and I'm quite amazed but 
what I, and I'm amazed at that people paid me to do what I did back then. Um, anyway, it was, a, it was a good thing to fall back on and I picked up a, some freelance work doing photo editing. Um, while I was doing that, I made a move to study a graduate diploma in computer science and then followed that through with a graduate diploma in education completing in 2002. I set my sights to become a secondary school teacher. And you'll see soon coming up a photo of me as a secondary school teacher. One thing to note, still got hair. <laughs> Losing a little bit there, but it's still there. Anyway, it's all about the hair, isn't it? Um, my teaching career took me from the classroom to a stint as a school principal, as well as a side hustle, writing as an education writer for Fairfax Media, and a 10-year um, stint as a lecturer in education for pre-service teaching at La Trobe University. From this, there opened up a wonderful opportunity for me, working with the Victorian Department of Education, uh, where I worked on a global project, which was really looking at the future of education, where, where learning was going, and how learning is, is, is changing in the, in the contemporary world. From there, I worked uh, to develop Victoria's tech schools, which ultimately led me here to Melbourne Polytechnic. As I said, a game of snakes and ladders. It's been a wonderful ex and exhilarating and, at times, a really scary ride. My career has been buffeted by forces of change outside my control. But for every challenge, every job closure and every dead end, there was an opportunity to be found. Further education and retraining gave me the keys to unlock these doors of opportunity. And for those of you who are taking your first steps, or your next steps in your career, remember that the job that you have 10 or 20 years from now most likely doesn't exist today. Navigating disruption and career change can be tough, but it can also be amazing. Be open, be curious, be up for the adventure. Regardless of whether we are childcare workers, bricklayers, artists, teachers, or even long forgotten tram conductors, all of us are lifelong learners. From wherever you go from here, remember, you have what it takes to learn. You have what it takes to succeed. And you have gained a qualification. You will adapt, you will evolve, you will grow, and you will be amazing. Trust me, you're ready for what happens next. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And what I love most about that story is it's not dissimilar to everyone that's on the faculty up here. Everyone's gone through many career changes, travelled the world, tried different things, and things haven't always gone the way they first thought they would have when they'd all graduated like you are all today. They've followed the ups and downs and adjusted, and they've all made amazing careers out of it. And the fact that they've all come here to teach at Molly, uh, Melbourne Polytechnic and share their knowledge with you is a truly wonderful. So how about a round of applause for these people up here tonight? <laughs> But today we are celebrating you. We're celebra celebrating the achievements of 32 Melbourne Polytechnic graduates. Supporting the presentation announcements today is Dr. Jordan Winfield. Uh, Dr. Jordan Winfield will be reading your names. He's hiding behind here to read those names. He can't see you, but he certainly can hear you. So give him some love. Now the moment you've all been waiting two or three years for, let's commence the ceremony. First up this afternoon are Auslan graduates from the Department of Bridging and Preparatory. For those students, we ask that all the audience members use the Auslan for clapping, which is... Please welcome Tracy Pierman, Manager of Bridging and Preparatory, to present the first awards. The graduates for Diploma of Auslan are... Sharon Hock. Sharon La. This student also completed Certificate 4 in Auslan. Kartik Vijaya Nandam. The student also completed Certificate 4 in Training and Assessment. Please join me in congratulating them.
Thank you, Tracy. Let's give our new graduates another round of applause. Wonderful work. Please now welcome Andrew Gennon, Manager of Creative Arts, to present the awards for the Department of Arts and the Department of Business, Advanced Manufacturing and Logistics. The graduate for Diploma of Live Production and Technical Services is Sarah Cameron. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduates for Advanced Diploma of Music Industry are Kelvin Jin Eung Yap. <laughs> Jennifer Zandi. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduate for Diploma of Music Industry is Indigo McKeon. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduate for Diploma of Theatre Arts is Paige Fessenmeyer. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduate for Diploma of Visual Arts is Louise Pete Anderson. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduate for Certificate 4 in Visual Arts is Sheridan Donovan. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduate for Diploma of Interior Design and Decoration is Vita Horm. This student also completed Certificate 4 in Interior Decoration. Please join me in congratulating them. Thank you, Andrew. And let's once more give those graduates another round of applause. Please now welcome Gary Patterson, Manager of Food, Fibre and Animal Industries, to present their department awards. The graduate for Diploma of Animal Technology is Michaela Diaz. Please join me in congratulating them. Thank you, Gary. Uh, join me in giving our new graduate a big round of applause. Please now welcome Kathy Kondikas, Manager of Human Services and Education, to present their department awards. The graduates for Diploma of Community Services are Arlis Bormita Galindo. Annette Brown. <laughs> Renato Marcenaro. <laughs> J. Mystica. Baljit Kaur Sarjan Singh. <laughs> Melody Sutton. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduate for Diploma of Early Childhood Education and Care is Chloe Waller. Please join me in congratulating them. Thank you, Kathy. 
Uh, join me in giving those graduates another round of applause. I'm assuming that graduation for community service is slightly different to the community service where I had to wear orange because I, I definitely didn't get an award at the completion of that. Um, please now welcome Rachel Cowley, Manager of Arts, Education and Agritech, Higher Education, to present their department awards. The graduates for Bachelor of Education Early Years are Fong Yuan Li, <laughs> Stephanie Lo Piccolo, <laughs> Saliha Pardes. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduates for Bachelor of Equine Studies are Kim Marie Arnup. Oh, please join me in congratulating them. The graduates for Bachelor of Music are Rosie Luby. <laughs> David Thomas Parks. <laughs> Katrina Josephine Rotuno. Please join me in congratulating them. The graduates for Bachelor of Songwriting and Music Production are Curtis William Piers, Joshua Anthony Sutherland Gatt. Please join me in congratulating them. Thank you, Rachel. And how about one more big round of applause for absolutely everyone tonight. You did it. You've all graduated. Exciting stuff. You should all be feeling uh, immensely proud of your achievements. It's incredible. Now for something very exciting. We're about to have our incredible guest speaker come on stage and talk to you all a little bit. To welcome them, please put your hands together for Melbourne Polytechnic Chief Executive, Francis Coppolillo. Thank you and congratulations, everyone. It's my pleasure now to introduce our MC today. Uh, our MC is a media personality you would not have guessed, Ben Murphy. Ben has made a name for himself as a world record-breaking co comedy magician and illusionist. He has now his own national radio show and TV series, live from St Kilda with Ben Murphy. Ben Murphy knows a thing or two about the need for continuous learning. When COVID brought an abrupt end to his international live performance schedule, Ben had to pivot and pivot quickly. We look forward to Ben sprinkling a little magic here today. Please join me in welcoming Ben Murphy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. Beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you so much for reading so eloquently what, what I wrote for you to say. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, part of being the MC tonight was that I was asked to come up here and talk a little bit about one of my favourite topics, me. How, and explain to you all that how after I graduated, like you all are today, that life immediately fell into place. And all of my dreams and goals were instantaneous, just like yours will be now that you've graduated and once you walk out that door. The reality is far from that. At my age of 30, <laughs> the learning changes and pivots have never stopped. And I haven't actually arrived at what I thought my final destination was. If you had told me when I was your age that I'd still be evolving, working different career paths and learning all the time, I think I would have wailed in despair. 
And yet I should have known because my dad told me from a young age, you never stop growing. He was a firm believer in constantly learning. When I was really, really little, he threw me in the lake. He thought throwing his son in the deep end and watching him struggle and gasp for breath was the fastest, surest way to learn. He was right. Uh, Not for me to swim, but for him to learn CPR. (laughs) He quickly learned that day. And ever since I was a child, I had this desire and dream to be a star. I found the start to my fame and fortune was by doing tricks. Uh, Not pretty woman, tricks on a corner type thing, but magic and illusion. I wanted to make the impossible possible. I believed in miracles. A little bit like seeing my favourite pair of pants after lockdown and thinking... I can still fit them. (laughs) Yes, I believed anything was possible. So I started out busking uh, to performing at kids' birthday parties, then corporate events and awards nights. I had set out and started slowly to piece together my dream, piece by piece from a very young age, step by step and learning each phase as I went. Every time I mastered a performance space, I had to reevaluate my work and modify it for the next. Performing on the street for coins and a hat out at the end is a very different type of performance to flying to perform for the royal family in Malaysia. You have to adjust and learn and grow. I learned pretty quickly that the best way to learn and grow in any chosen field was to say yes to everything. Well, except say yes to the sweet old lady who asks you to carry her bags through customs. I uh, should have said no to that, (laughs) hence the community service. You've got to say yes and worry about the how after. The learning part is really easy. Grabbing those opportunities that swing past you and are kind of scary and are filled with the unknown, that's the hard part. So when you see them, just grab it and say yes. Work out the rest later. In my early 20s, I was offered my very own Vegas-style show in the United States of America. The caveat was that I would have to perform the infamous Houdini water torture trick. An illusion where the magician is shackled by their ankles, hung upside down, handcuffed, and lowered into a tank filled with water. Many magicians have died performing this a trick. The idea is to escape before you drown. I was asked, Ben, can you perform this trick? Yes, of course I can, I said. I'd never done anything remotely close to it, but I really wanted this opportunity to go overseas. So I accepted the contract and I started learning how to escape upside down. Practicing on the local monkey bars in the playground, hanging myself upside down, popping on straight jackets, and just getting used to that sensation. I googled and learnt every way I could to slow my heart rate. And to practice holding my breath, I'd often be found with my face down in the bathtub. I did everything I could to prepare for this amazing opportunity. And speaking of bathtubs, last Christmas, my mother-in-law said she wanted something for the bath for Christmas, but uh, she really hated the toaster. <laughs> it's not true. She, uh, she loved it. Uh, the, um, yeah, she was quite shocked by it, to tell you the truth. Um, the study paid off, and I achieved by breaking the world record for the most consecutive performances of this illusion in history, a record which I still hold to this day. I even beat Harry Houdini himself. This is something that would not have been possible if I wasn't prepared to learn and face my fears. So whatever you do, always give 100%, uh, unless you're donating blood. (laughs) Upon returning to Australia with my world record title in hand, I was then offered another amazing opportunity. This time, in China. I was asked, Ben, do you speak Mandarin? (laughs) Yes, of course I do. Uh, I didn't. The closest I'd ever been was having sweet and sour pork at the Westfield Food Court. So I got myself in quite a big bit of water there. So uh, I downloaded every language app I could, and I got my script translated verbatim into Mandarin, and I enrolled in several short courses, and I did everything I could to prepare for this contract overseas. It turned out to be a lot more challenging than I'd first anticipated. However, it paid off in dividends. I ended up touring China almost consistently for eight years. I ended up with a couple of TV specials in Mongolia as well at prime time, which was pretty exciting. And the best part is that the Chinese love magic. They also really love buying merchandise. And my merchandise was made in China for 52 cents each. I would then sell it back to the Chinese for $10 each. 
Really good. Highly recommended. I was having the absolute best time of my life, living the superstar dream, but I wanted to push myself a little bit further. I wanted to try something that had nothing to do with magic and illusion. But the curse of an entertainer is you live gig to gig, paycheck to paycheck, and all of my gigs took me overseas, and they certainly didn't allow me the luxury to take a break and try my hand at anything new. So at the end of 2019, I decided I was going to retire from the world of touring and find a way to be successful here in Australia. So I ended up signing my final contract. It was for 18 months. I thought that's long enough for me to prepare for what I was going to do once that 18 months was over. And it was also a long enough grieving time for me to slowly say goodbye to the job that I'd loved and had done so well for me over the years. I came home for a very short month's break, a little breather before the farewell tour began in March 2020. <laughs> yes, well, we all know what happened globally and the many lives that affected. For me personally, I lost my contract. I lost a lot of confidence. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye and I was suddenly thrown into unemployment with no real world skills that could help me make some money in this new world. And if one more person told me to pivot, I, I was going to lose it. I was gutted, depressed, and completely and utterly lost for a good few months, like crying and not getting out of bed depressed. I was in a really bad state. But then it dawned on me, a little longer than it should have, that all of those things I wanted to start doing at the end of that 18-month tour, that I could actually start today. I'd always wanted to try my hand at radio, so I immediately enrolled myself in some short courses, media law, reading for radio, creating radio and podcast content, and a whole lot more. I really loved learning new things. I volunteered at Vision Australia Radio, reading magazines, which then transferred to me having my very own chat show on Joy 94.9, where I got to be a bit more of my silly self, make jokes, and interview celebrities, which I loved. And I was really good at interviewing famous people. So I started on my own accord, my own um, video slash podcast series, I'd reach out directly to people I'd never met before that were in the public ID. I, um, sorry, I'm not speaking very well today, a little bit of nerves. And I would beg these people to participate and help make some content with me. One guest, Gretel Colleen, the former host of Big Brother, told me that I could have a maximum of 15 minutes of her time. We chatted on record for 45 minutes and about another 30 off the record. She told me that despite what I'd lost, that she believed what I was doing right now was what I was meant to be doing. She loved the way I'd really researched her and wasn't just asking silly questions, but having a thoughtful conversation that was still really fun and light. A skill she said most interviewers can't do. She hooked me up with a whole bunch of her celebrity pals and allowed me to have several more episodes chatting to celebrities. It was a lot of fun and very, very kind of her. Channel 31, a community TV station here in Melbourne, had seen these Zoom online video chats with people and asked if they could play them on their platform. I thought about it and I thought what I really wanted to do was a proper chat show where people were in studio while I was talking to celebrities, a little bit like Graham Norton, but I also wanted a platform where fellow variety entertainers could perform and showcase their talents. We don't really have that in Australia, unless, of course, you count Australia's Got Talent, but having a senior citizen sword-swallowing BMX riding tattooed gymnast with an acrobatic dog from Nimbin, competing against a cute-as-a-button child, four-year-old, dressed in an Elsa costume singing Let It Go, doesn't feel like a fair comparison. So I came up with my dream variety chat show, and I said to Channel 31, can I make this? Well, the answer from them was yes, great! So I signed on for 13 episodes. Again, I found myself in a pickle, that unwanted green atrocity on any McDonald's burger. I'd kind of bluffed my way in, even though I'd been making content. It was at home with a ring light and a camera. I actually had no cameras, no crew, no editing experience, zero experience producing and hosting my own TV show, no money to make it, and I was now legally bound to 13 episodes. So research and learn I did. Phone calls, meetings, GoFundMes, begging for people's time and advice absolutely consumed me. And here's the thing I learned. If you need advice from a professional and you approach anyone, like absolutely anyone, in a power or a place of knowledge with respect, respect for A, knowing who that person is and what they themselves have achieved, 
and B, approach them knowing clearly what it is you want from them and what they can offer you. Almost everyone, no matter how famous or how busy you perceive them to be, will offer you time and advice. It's really that easy. Just pick up the phone, contact them, and say, can you help me? And almost all of them will say, yes, it's incredible. So I was making a TV series with zero experience of TV, but a wealth in putting on a show and organizing crews. In my mind, it was the exact same thing. The only thing that had changed was the medium. My honesty and blind faith in what I wanted to achieve was admired, and people were excited to see if I could pull it off. I'd won them over by being prepared, kind, enthusiastic, and always confident without being too cocky or arrogant. Before long, I had a venue to film in, a production company, seven cameras, sound equipment, LED screens, graphics, logos, music composed, a team of 36, and almost all of it was free and volunteers. Pretty mind-blowing stuff. Those initial 13 half-hour episodes were a hit and were immediately another 13-episode season extended to an hour for each episode was ordered. And we were receiving about 120 to 150,000 views a week, which is up there with Studio 10, Neighbours, and shows that were on commercial TV. It was pretty, pretty exciting. However, at the same time I was contemplating doing Series 2, I was then offered my very own breakfast show on ABC in Perth. And I thought, the ABC, actual money, exciting stuff. Put me in a little bit of a pickle. I was then also asked to return back to China now that things had sort of cleared up a little bit. And they offered me a little bit more money to go back and finish that 18-month tour. That was uh, some really tough days and there were some huge decisions to make. Do I look out for myself and go and get some money? Or do I believe in myself and the community TV show that I'd made and the team of 36 volunteers I'd put together? It was genuinely a really, really tough time. We ended up filming season two this year with a live studio audience. We had publicists contacting us, asking if their clients could be on the show. No longer was I begging them to appear. People had seen series one, enjoyed the show, and were very impressed with the quality. We had guests from Miriam Margulies, Vanessa Amorosi, Dr. Carl from Neighbours, they needed the ratings, <laughs> Toddy Goldsmith, The Real Housewives of Melbourne, Isaiah Firebrace, Peking Duck, and a whole lot more. We also got on more platforms from Channel 31. We got on 44 in Adelaide, Face TV in New Zealand. We were on in Fiji, in Vanuatu, and I also got my show on Foxtel. Even though I was airing initially and making a show for a community platform, I set out from the start saying that I wanted the show to look like a commercial product. It paid off. I'm now currently in negotiations with a commercial TV station here for Series 3, along with a couple of streaming services. And the thing I'm most proud about my negotiations I'm having with these stations at the moment is I've managed to secure paid positions for all the people that were with me from day one on this journey. And that's something that I'm super, super excited. Because <laughs> without them, I, I wouldn't be here today. And, and that's very genuine. Um, so in the last year... <laughs> taxi? 26 episodes in less than a year is what I've now produced and aired. I've personally booked over 60 guests, 42 variety acts, 26 bands, and 52 game show contestants with a show that didn't exist, not even in my mind less than a year ago this week. I took the worst thing that happened to me and everyone. We were all impacted in one way or another, the loss of my job and income, and I used that time to learn. Yes, I had exceptionally dark days where it all felt genuinely impossible. But if I learned as much as I could each day and surrounded myself with warm, lovable, talented people that believed in me and what I had to offer, I knew it would be okay. I also knew that if I was asking others to help me, I had to ensure that I had something to offer them in return. I kept and continue to keep an eye out for any way I can return the favour. And I ensured that each day that they showed up to set to help me for free, that I was prepared, ready, well informed, that I was always the first to arrive and the last to leave. Being professional was the very least I could do. Though the future of the show is uncertain, I know if I back myself and am prepared to listen and learn continuously, I will always be on the path I'm meant to be. So if someone offers you a job that you really want to do, but you don't quite know how, say yes and go and learn it afterwards. Don't miss out on that opportunity. 
If someone says your idea is crazy, it's impossible, it's not going to happen, say, yes, it will, and then go and do it. Learn. Don't worry about them. And when someone asks you to carry their luggage through customs, say no. (laughs) I cannot stress that enough. You've got to believe in yourself and back yourself by always preparing yourself. Put in the work and say yes to making your dreams a reality. I do really hope you enjoyed what I had to say, and if not, I hope that you feel really well rested after that 10-minute nap. (laughs) To summarise, if I can achieve what I have, each and every one of you will also, if only you take the time to continuously learn. Thank you. (laughs) Once again, I would like to congratulate each and every one of you. You've done an incredible job. Congratulations on your graduation. I'd also like to thank Dr. Jordan Winfield, uh, the reading the names of the graduates this evening. Uh, Give him some love. A big thank you to Oscar and Mick out the front for our pre-show entertainment. And of course, Stacey and Mark, our Auslan interpreters, for helping us out here today. Uh, Please join us in the foyer for the next hour for a post-graduation celebration. You'll meet Melbourne Polytechnic staff and other graduates and their guests. And a final reminder that photography will be taking place on level four for all of those that have bookings. It's a thank you and good afternoon from me. Please all stand for the academic procession. You can breathe now, you did it, congratulations. Enjoy your afternoon, go celebrate and make your dreams come true, thank you.